the man of God that the Lord has sent before us, our very own. Let's celebrate him. Pastor Moses Anderson. Thank you, Alan. I appreciate that. God is good. Awesome, awesome. All righty. Um, a couple of things real quick. Joshua, did we record all of what Alan was saying just now? As he was praying, that's awesome. Because um, by the grace of God, we will remember it. Very soon, we would have a glorious reason to revisit it in righteousness. Let's all be seated. Praise God. God is good. All righty. So, I think we're just going to get right into it. Um, how am I sounding? Oh, yeah, yeah, sorry. I think I'm, a, I'm sounding good in here. I'm just asking the men in the booth. Yeah, we're good to go. Praise the Lord. God is good. You know, sometimes when people suspect something may go wrong, don't just think it's a suspicion. I was talking to Bennett and Bennett was like, oh, we need to check your mic before you go up. And that was before Tuesday's meeting, right? And then I didn't check my mic. And then when we played back the recording, the part that was online, the first like two minutes or so wasn't good. So I'm like, okay, the next time Bennett suspects anything, we'll take you very seriously. So I apologize for not taking you as seriously as I should. God is good. <laughs> you know, he said it almost like he was like, oh, you know, like he saw it coming. Uh, but praise God, it looks like it's sounding good and sounding all right right now. Awesome. So let's do this. Um, I don't want anyone sitting behind Anne. So if you're sitting by Anne, Anne apart from uh, anyone doing daddy duty in the back or mommy duty, that's fine. But as many of us as could. Okay, Antoine, if I, that would be you. So maybe you can come and sit. Come and sit right next to Diamond here. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Or you can even sit up front here. Yeah, yeah. You look good on camera. Yeah. God is good. Alrighty. And so what we're going to do is, I want us to, I mean, this is very non-customary of me to encourage praying sitting down. You see, because when you look through scriptures, uh, you would hardly find anybody who prayed sitting down. In fact, the one person that people kind of wanted to squeeze into that bracket was Nehemiah. Because the Bible says that after he had thought about the things that the Lord said, he sat down to contemplate. But he was, con he was thinking, processing, was not the same thing as praying. Because when he prayed afterwards, he lifted up his voice, he lifted up his head, and he was standing. So, but today, we're going to do certain things sitting down. Um, because, you know, the sitting posture could also be a symbol of authority as a king or a prince. Thank you, Alan. As one who sits upon a throne. And I would want for us, as the band plays some music as they are led, for us to declare things over our lives. You know, Alan was just here talking about the double portion of the anointing, and now I'm getting double water. Is This is awesome. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Anita. Oh, yeah, I'll take it. I think it's a good sign. And I'm going to drink Alan's once too, so it doesn't feel like I am discriminating. Praise the Lord. You know how it is. Remember, you remember, what's his name? Isaac. Was it Isaac? He was Isaac. You know, when Jacob brought the, um, the, the meal, when Esau came, Isaac was like, man, I'm already full. You know, and the guy fell back the rest of his life. So I don't want anyone to feel bad. Huh? I'm going to have a taste of this. So as the spirit leads, you all just flow for like maybe 30 seconds to a minute. And um, Rosemary, you can sit where I was sitting. It's okay. It doesn't have my name on it. Oh, yeah, yeah. Praise God. So... We would make declarations. The Bible says, where the word of a king is, there is power. And you and I need to be more determined to remind ourselves or to be reminded that we are kings and priests unto our God. Because if you look around you, everything else in the world is trying to make you feel little. The world system is designed so that you continue to feel like you are grasshoppers in their sight. The children of this world, particularly the sect of wickedness, they always want us to feel very little, to be very little in our eyes. It's a Jericho syndrome. Remember when the children of Israel were going to possess Jericho? What happened was the 10 out of the 12 spies that were sent they felt so intimidated. They felt so little because everything in Jericho is big. That is the reason why when you look at religious organizations and governmental organizations, because they want to appear as though they have authority over you, their buildings have to be the biggest. 
Because every time you look at the monstrosity and the enormity of structures that are positioned by systems, he's meant to make you feel like you cannot do anything. You just have to do as you're told. Whereas the Bible says, greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. If I let us save our declarations for the end, because I believe there are certain things that we need to get situated so that when we are making such declarations, we are making the declarations with all the authority that we can muster because it's a new day and we need to start to prepare for who is coming. You know, the world itself is trying to prepare us for what is coming, but we look beyond the what to the who is coming. I mean, because for me, I don't care about the earthquake that is coming other than the fact that it's here to announce to me my season of expectation. I'm not particularly bothered about the Antichrist being revealed because at the end of the day, the Antichrist is going to lord over most of the world, but he's not going to lord over me because I have not been given to him. I've already been given to the Lord Jesus. And Jesus says, of the ones that the Father has given to me, none shall be lost. So you see the reason why I am not particularly worried about whatever may be coming, because I already know who is coming and his coming is for me and not against me. Praise the Lord. And so we will do a couple of things. If I let's take a quick look at Revelation chapter 19, verse 2. We're going to pray because the band likes us to pray before they get down. So let us pray so that they can be relieved. Look at what it says in Revelation chapter 19, verse 2. In fact, I'll show you something real quick in Genesis chapter 2, verse 17 to 19. And then we'll come back to these revelations because some of these things are so... Um, needed or is the great or let me put it this way it's good for us to present them in a balance so genesis 2 17 to 19 what does it say i'm going to read 17 and 19 actually it says but of the tree of knowledge of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat for in the day that you eat of it you shall die. Verse 19 says, Out of the ground the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every bird of the air and brought them to Adam to see what he would call them. So basically, without having eaten of the fruit of the knowledge of good and evil, God expects man to operate by another kind of knowledge. You see, at this particular point in time, man has not partaken of the fruit of the knowledge of good and evil. But God brought all the animals to him to see what he would call them. Do you know that one of the, one of the most elaborate and robust fields of study is zoology? There are so many species of animals, so different um, types of animal behaviors. The animal instinct is not that easily decipherable. And yet, God brought all the animals to Adam who had yet to eat of the fruit of the knowledge of good and evil. And God had an expectation that he would know what to call them. And the Bible says here that, verse 19, and whatever, I'm reading the B part now, or maybe the C part, depending on what translation you have. And whatever Adam called each living creature was their name. The Bible did not say it became their name. Whatever he called them was the name that God called them in the day that he made them. Because everything God makes, he names. He didn't say, oh, let's just make uh, some, some things and then we'll call them animals. No, he gave them names because he always says, let there be. Because if God had just said, let there be dogs, there would have been one dog type that looks like all the dogs that you know. Or that you know. So God is of the function or the process or the, or the method of calling things by their names. You see, when the Bible was describing the new creation that we are in Christ Jesus and the citizenship that we will have in the new Jerusalem, the Bible says that each and every one of us will have a name that is imprinted on us that only God can read, that God alone can read. So he has a unique name for every single one of us. So Adam was calling them the name that God called them when God made them. Remember that every single animal was made before man was made. You see what I mean? And that was the confusion of some guys who thought we evolved from them because they were here before us. No, God made them and made us. Same day, on the sixth day, he made all the beasts of the field. And then later in that day, he made man. And so the Bible says Adam was able to discern 
what God calls them even before he came on the scene. Now, when you operate at that kind of knowledge, why do you need to eat anything else? I'll tell you a little bit about it, but let me tell you right now. One of the clearest distinctions between the kind of knowledge that Adam was formed with and the one that Satan tempted them to receive is this. One of them is a lesser kind of knowledge, a knowledge that is always observing and judging and trying to determine, is this good or is this bad? Is this good or is this bad? That is, that is, um, is, is almost less than that of an animal. You understand what I mean? Have you seen a dog in the wild? Maybe not in the wild. I mean, because a lot of the dogs in the West, they're so pampered that they don't even look after themselves. But when you go to developing countries where dogs are left to fend for themselves for the most part, the only thing they come to do is at night, they come to eat the leftovers. But morning till night, they fend for themselves. Most of them don't go to vets and they stay healthy. How do they stay healthy? They would go out in the nearby bush whenever there's something wrong with them and they will discern what plant they need to eat to fix whatever ailments they have. I have seen our dog when I was growing up eat stuff that was not good for its body. He laid around for a little while and we knew that it wasn't feeling well. Then suddenly it got up, went out into the yard. He ate some leaves and he was able to pass out every wrong thing that he ate. And he wagged his tail like he had just won the lottery. He was fine all over again. You see what I mean? And that kind of knowledge is still less than the kind of knowledge, I mean, it's still higher than the kind of knowledge with which we operate. Because you as a person, if nobody told you what to pluck out of the forest and you go out there, you may not come out. Because somebody has to tell us that this is good. You understand what I mean? But when Adam was made, he was operating at a knowledge level that was not instinct, but that was inspired. You see, instinct is mostly for survival. But when you operate being inspired by God, then you radiate the glory of God because everything you touch becomes gold and everything you do is good before your heavenly father. Now was the kind of knowledge that Adam was operating with, wherein he just knew what was in the heart of the father. And when Jesus came, being the second Adam, that was not conceived by the seed of man, but the seed of the woman given to her by the Holy Spirit. He was operating on the same kind of knowledge. That was why he said, whatsoever I see my father do, that I do. Whatever he says, that I say. Even if I'm not there when he said it, the moment I open my mouth because I am one with him, I just say what's on his mind. And so when Adam came, Adam was the very first person in human genealogy to be referred to as a son of God. Before he became an ordinary man, he was made a son of God. Matthew chapter 1, you read the genealogy of Jesus Christ. And when he was wrapped up, what was the description of Adam? You know, they said Jesus was the son of this, I mean, Joseph was the son of this person. David was the son of Jesse. And they kept going on and on. And then when he got to Adam and they said, Adam, the son of God. Because when you are God's son, you are one with him. You know his mind and you are led by his Holy Spirit. So I want us to put that at the back of our minds before we pray. And now let's go to Genesis, I mean, Revelations chapter 19, verse 2. Revelations chapter 19, verse 2. One of my favorites of all times. Look at what the Bible says here. The Bible says, for true and righteous are his judgments. <laughs> because he has judged the great harlot who corrupted the earth with her fornication. And he has avenged her on her the blood of his servants, the blood of his servants shed by her. Great scripture, but the part of it that I want us to focus on is the A part. The Bible says, for true and righteous are his judgments. Father, in the mighty name of Jesus, may we judge as we you judge. Let us be reminded of who we are and the privileges that we have in your Holy Spirit to be led by you, to be led by your Holy Spirit in all truth unto all righteousness. Such that whether we turn to the left or to the right, we will always do that which your Holy Spirit says. Declaring over us from within us that this is the way, walk in it. So Lord, as everyone is here today, open to receive your word. Let us hear your Holy Spirit speak to each and every heart. That word that convicts the sinner of their sins and the believer of righteousness. In the mighty name of Jesus, Lord, let your word do us great good today as it always does. 
let our hearts open to receive with meekness your implanted word. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise the Lord. God is good. Alrighty. So, we're looking at a situation here wherein God has an expectation of us. But for us to be able to live up to God's expectation of us, we need to recognize why he has those expectations. You know, when the word of God commands us to do a thing, God really expects us to do it. Now, if I expect, let me find somebody here who is not fit for a particular kind of sport. Okay, let me say that Antoine here. I expect him to do a 360 degree dunk on the basketball court. It's most likely not going to happen because he doesn't seem to be built for that in height. But then if I put him on the field of play, I said, what, what position is there in the NFL for people who can defend and block all the whatever? Yeah, defense line. He'll be great for that because if I try to run into one-to-one, -one, I will bounce back like a table tennis egg. You understand what I mean? Simply because that's what it's built for. You see those broad shoulders? They didn't come from Macy's. They came from God for a reason. You understand what I mean? Why is that important? It is important to know that when God made each and every one of us, he gave us certain equipping so that we can fulfill destiny and he's not going to ask you to do things that he hasn't made you for. So God is not going to expect that your little chihuahua will be working as a tree climber. You understand what I mean? No. And God does not expect you to keep a monkey in the house either, simply because you don't have enough bars to keep it exercised. It is important for us to know that the righteous, the judgment of God is true and it is righteous. That's what we just read in Revelation chapter 19, verse 2, that the judgment of God is true and righteous. And what does that tell me? What that tells me is that whatever God asks me to do, he asks me to do because he has given me the divine enablement to be able to do it. So if God asks me to do things that he hasn't equipped me for, then he is no longer true and righteous. Does it make sense? Now, let me just quickly do this here. Come with me very quickly to the book of John chapter 14. I want to show you two things here, or maybe one, and if the second one is not as apparent, then we'll go to Mark and take a look at it there. But John chapter 14, look at verse 3. John, the book of John, the gospel according to St. John. I have an interesting theory about the book of John. Can I tell you real quick? You know that um, I'm, not the, I'm not the best friend. I'm not best friends with the Catholic Church for obvious reasons. Even though my wife was raised a Catholic, but thank God now she's here, speaking in tongues, filled with the Holy Spirit, exploring the things of God by the Holy Spirit as opposed to by the dictates of men. But one of the, and one of the interesting things about, um, let me not use the conjunction. Let me just say one of the interesting things about the Catholic Church was that they gave us 66 scriptures, right? And you know me, I am not the happiest camper with that arrangement, even though I'm very thankful. You understand what I mean, but there is more. They gave us 66 books, and you remember that I've said this before, that if you have a man, the number of man is the number six, because man was made on the sixth day. And pretty much everything about man is a multiple of six, right? To some ratio or to some degree. The Bible says there are three that bear witness in heaven, but two bear witness on the earth. And sometimes the two is three because the three can be two. And God does all of that to let you know that the numbers two and three are essentially the constituent numbers that make up six, the number of man, right? And so when you look at it, anywhere you dissect it, man has the number three. The other day we were talking at the men's meeting and we talked about the fact that the human body the helix, the DNA helix or whatever it's called has two strands and each one of them is what? 72,000 chromosomes, which is also a multiple of what? Six. And why is it a multiple of six? Because if you multiply 12 by six, what do you get? 
72. And why 12? Because 12 represents the number of God's inheritance on the earth. That's why we have 12 tribes in Israel. We have 12 tribes of the Islamic nations. We have 12 tribes of the apostles, 12 apostles, they're not tribes, but 12 apostles representing the church. The Bible says in the new heavenly Jerusalem, there will be 12 walls and there will be 12 gates. You, you understand what I mean? Representing the 12 apostles and the 12 prophets. There were 24 elders representing the apostles and what? Representing the tribes of Israel because together they come to make the number of the, the elaborated number of the witnesses. That was the reason why when they cast their crowns down to bow before the Lord, they said we bow before the one who is, who was and is to come for by his blood we have been saved. You understand what I mean? And so you know that the number six is the number of men, right? And we can keep dissecting it however we like, but it's always going to come back to number six. Why? Because man was made on the sixth day, right? What is the number of God? Seven is the number of God because God has seven spirits. There are seven spirits of God. I know you know about the Holy Spirit, but yes, the Holy Spirit is the totality of the spirits of God. But individually, there are seven spirits of God, the spirit of wisdom, the spirit of the grace of God, the spirit of, and it goes on and on. You can read all of that in, uh, in the book of Isaiah, I believe chapter two. But let me tell you something. When you look at those numbers, they're very significant because they're consistent. There are seven golden lampstands representing the seven spirits of God. There were seven candlesticks representing the seven angels of the church because each of the angels of the church is supposed to bring a dimension of the revelation of God to the church because the church is meant to be an express manifestation of God. Now, I'm saying a lot of things very quickly, but I know that's because people here, some people have looked into it, some people need to look into it. But come back to the number six as the number of men. When you hold a Bible that has 66 books, what does that give you? It gives you 666. You understand what I mean? Now, that, is in the, that may sound like it's in the region of conspiracy theories, but I also know for a fact that when we see things like that, it's meant to make us stop and ask a question and say, is this a coincidence or there is more? Right? Is this a coincidence or there is more? Now, let's come back to something else. The Bible that we currently have, the 66 books, is, and I'll tell you why this is beneficial to me. Maybe you can learn something from it because I've never really heard anybody break it down this way. But when it was broken down to me like this in my meditation, it really blessed me. The Bible that is in your hands has got 66 books, 39 books in the Old Testament, correct? And 27 books in the New Testament, right? 39 of the Old, 27 of the new, right? The interesting thing about it is, and I don't want you to dwell on this too much, but I'm gonna just say it, you can go process it later. If you take two and you add it to seven, it gives you nine. So you're looking at three, nine, nine, and when you break all of that down, it still ends up being a comp composition of six, six, six. You understand what I mean? So one day I sat and I thought to myself, I said, wait a minute, that is the dichotomy that was presented to us of the old and the new. But from my understanding of scripture, where did the New Testament really begin? When you read the Bible very well, you will understand that even though there was a 400 year gap between Malachi and Matthew, when you read Malachi and you continue reading Matthew, there seemed to be a continuation. The Jesus of Matthew, Mark, and Luke was a Jesus that came to fulfill the Old Testament. And so a lot of what he said about himself, a lot of what he manifested about himself was the son of man that was promised in the Old. When you read about the ministry of John the Baptist, it was what Malachi was prophesying. When you look at the ministry of Simon and Hannah, it was an extension of the Old Testament. When Jesus was relating with the Pharisees and the Sadducees, all of that was still very much in the Old Testament arena of things. But the moment we got to the book of John, the Bible says, in the beginning. Genesis started with in the beginning. John starts with in the beginning. But this time around, he introduced the, the word of God Jesus was now introduced to us as the Christ. 
He was introduced to us as the word of God that became flesh, that takes away the sins of the world. He was introduced to us as the Christ, the anointed one and his anointing because it was that anointing that started the New Testament. He says, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor and the opening of prison doors to those who have been held bound. If those doors were not open, we still would have been held bound in the shadow of the law. Now, when you go back to the math, it makes a bit more sense now. Because if we take the three chapters, the three books out of the 27, and we add that to the 39, what does that give us? It gives us the number 42. Right? 39 plus 3 is 42. What is the number 42? Because you know I've preached several sermons around the number 42. The number 42 talks about God holding the hand of man. You've seen a lot of these uh, paintings on, 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 on the walls of cathedrals and temples from the Renaissance to the, to the, um, to the what's the other uh, period that we had? A lot of all those periods, I can't remember what they're called now, but people keep having different iterations of the image of God reaching out to touch the finger of man. How many people know what I'm talking about? I think the original painting was by Da Vinci. So when you look at the number 42, it represents the union or the relationship between God and man because God is seven and man is six. Seven times six, what does it give you? It gives you 42. What did we see throughout the Old Testament? It was always God and man. God and man, God and man, God and man. To the point where God is like, man, I'm done. I ain't doing this no more. He says, my spirit will no longer strive with man because he is in deep flesh. So man with the number six kept butting head with God, the number seven. God was bringing a kind of perfection that man cannot attain unto because it was not given to him. But then once you've taken the three out of the 27, what are you left with? You're left with 24 books. That would have been a more insightful and a more inspiring dichotomy of scriptures if they had broken it down into 42 and 24. Because essentially the number 42 is the number 24 as a mirror image. Because when Jesus came, he came so that we can see the glory of God. And the apostle says, now we have beheld his glory, the glory of the son of God. And how, where, where, where were we told that? We were told that in the beginning of the New Testament in John chapter one, the Bible says the word of God became flesh and dwelt amongst men and we beheld his glory and it was the glory of the son of man. And later on, the apostle Paul elaborated on what John was saying. He says, we are looking as in the mirror, the glory of the Lord. If you look at the number 42 in the mirror, it gives you 24. And the reason why I'm excited about the number 24 is not just because of the 24 elders, but it's because of the fact that the number 24 contains two other numbers apart from 12 and 2. It contains the number 6 and 4, which is the number of what? The number of man and the number of heavenly activities upon the earth. Because when you look at all the activities of revelations, they are perpetrated by who? By the four horsemen of the apocalypse. Because they bring all of that wind of destruction that begins the dispensation that we're in. And so what God is saying is now, I will let my sons rule upon the earth because now I've given them the authority of Christ. So it is us against nature. I'm going to say that again because I don't think somebody got it. In the Old Testament, it was God and man. God had to keep making things happen because man was the problem. But the Bible says that when the end comes, there will be two major participants in the last days. And who are they? Creation. Creation itself has the number four. Right? Because number four is the number of the earth. Because you have the north, the east, the west, and the south. Which gives you news. North, east, west, and south. Let me tell you something. About the creation, the Bible says that the earnest expectation of creation eagerly waits for God. No. For the manifestation of the sons of God. So the most glorious expectation that God has for us is that we can take his place. Not that we can replace him because nobody can replace God. Because to replace a thing, you need to have a temporary holding place to create a vacancy. And there is no place big enough to contain God. Because in reality, you know, when we think about God, we always say that God sits in the heavens and his, the earth is his footstool. Okay, we know where he sits when he appears, but where does he live? Because he must live somewhere before he created the heavens and the earth. Anyway, story for another day. But this God, as big as he is, as awesome, as magnificent, and as marvelous as he is, 
he steps aside after the Old Testament was complete. And he says, now I'm empowering my sons to handle creation. I have spent all of these 4,000 years demonstrating to them how to do it. He says, but now I want them to now do it unto creation as I have done unto them. Do you know that up until Jesus came, the people that had expectation, it wasn't creation that had expectation. The trees were not expecting the Messiah. It was people that were expecting the Messiah. And now that the Messiah has come, it is now the turn of creation expecting us to show up the way people were expecting God to show up in the Old Testament. But if God is really true and righteous in his expectations, if he's expecting me to do the things that he did in the Old Testament, if he's expecting for me to work miracles, because pretty much all the miracles that were worked in the Old Testament were worked by God. Even the ones that seem to have happened in the hands of men, every single time it was said that the Spirit of God came upon them to activate them for that purpose. And when the Spirit of God was gone, they were useless. They were only temporarily useful. You understand what I mean? So if God is now saying, he's expecting me to do that, where did he tell me? When Jesus was living, he told his disciples, he says, now you have been activated. He says, now you have been given the power to heal the sick, to raise the dead. You have been given the power, the power, the same eternal power that God used in creating everything has not been given to you and I. You see, the reason why the world wants us to continue to feel small and to think small, because the moment we realize that we are now God's representatives on the earth, it changes everything. The Bible says, Jesus speaking, he says, you shall lay your hands on the sick and they shall recover. Because everything that your heavenly father did in the Old Testament, that I also did in the period of transition, you are also going to do. We only did that as a model to you. Jesus didn't have to walk on water. He could have just appeared on the boat. But then we will continue to be at a loss of how we did it. So he walked on water so that you will know what to do. He came to, as the ultimate example to model to us. He did all of those things so that we can learn. But because we are beholding in the mirror, in order for us to do everything that Jesus did, we needed to start with the last thing that he did. Because you know, in the mirror, the first becomes the last and the last becomes the first. And Jesus told us that. He says the last will be the first and the first will be the last. So what was the last thing that he did? The Bible says greater love, Jesus speaking, has no man than this, than for a man to lay down his life for his friends. If I haven't laid down my life for my friends, then there's no way I'm going to call my friend who was dead back to life again. I need to walk my way back from where Jesus left off so that I can end up where he started. And where did he start? The Bible says the word of God became flesh and dwelt amongst men. My ultimate goal is that one day this flesh will become the word of God. He left his glory so that I can get into glory. The Bible says in Romans chapter 8 that whom he did for no, he predestined. Whom he predestined, he called. Whom he called, he justified. And whom he justified, what did he do? He glorified. So the end of us is to be glorified, but the beginning of him was he came out of glory. The Lord has an expectation of us to be Jesus is on the earth. I don't even like to use the word little Jesus is anymore because we need to delete the word little from our mindset. We're always thinking of ourselves in, in the terms of what we can do in the natural, when the Bible says, stop being merman, stop being ordinary man. Stop just being as ordinary as the, everybody tells you you are. People tell you, you have to do this for that to happen. No, I don't. I can just declare it because the Bible says you will declare a thing and it shall be so. 
You know, because we're always like, oh, I wish I could do that. You know, but then this has to happen. That I, my, the same cousin of mine that I was telling you about that inspired us with that scripture. In fact, it wasn't just one scripture. He gave us a set of scriptures when he said, the house where you're at now is too small for you. You need a bigger house. And he says, this was how we got this mansion. He gave us scriptures that the Lord gave to him. You know, one of the things that he said to me, he told me, he said, when they moved into their previous house, which was one of the best houses in the neighborhood, he went on a business trip and the cab driver, whoever picked him up from the airport, as they were driving into the neighborhood in Brookhaven, the driver looked back at him and says, you live here? He says, are you sure that we're entering the right neighborhood? He says, yes, we are. He says, so your house is one of these houses. He says, you're soon going to see. And you know what the driver said? The driver said to him, he says, well, I wouldn't even bother asking you how. He said, because if I ask you, I'm sure you're just going to say God did it. He said, but I know it's because you have a good job. My cousin was like, that level of assumption was too much for him to even respond to. So he just came down from the car. His heart was broken. He said, why didn't that gentleman give himself an opportunity to even hear from the horse's mouth? Okay, let's say it's the good job, but that the Bible lets us know that every good gift and every perfect gift comes from the Father of light. Every good gift. So if you have anything that is good, it can only come from God. Well, having more money than you can spend is not necessarily a good thing. Because as soon as I said every good thing comes from above, you'd be thinking about Hollywood celebrities who have all this shiny stuff. No, a lot of them do not have the maturity of soul to handle the things that they have. And that was why Satan gave it to them so that he can destroy them completely without recovery. That's why the Bible says God will not give you more than you can handle. But Satan will give people too many shows, more shows than they can handle. And they will need to be on drugs to be able to show up on television every time. He will give them more money than they can handle so they're no longer happy with just one wife. They want to be able to just marry everything that moves because now they have the money, they can afford it. You understand what I mean? And so every good gift and every perfect gift, the Bible says, comes from above, from the Father of light. And so God is the giver of good things. Instead of this man to ask, he made an assumption. And you know what that kind of behavior reveals? It reveals the potential nature of every single one of us if we are not careful. We live by assumption, assumption rather than by, by living by revelation. We always want to assume that we have to do this to do that. I'm always thankful for my sister. My sister is an interrogator. Even though sometimes she interrogates me to the point wherein I pretend like I'm asleep when I'm not. There are so many times that my sister has called me and she might watch this online, but uh, maybe I'll apologize later. Oh yeah, she would call me and be asking me questions and I pretend like my phone has disconnected. Sometimes I even go to, uh, let me teach you this little trick. Because if you cut off, it will show call ended. So I go to my flight mode to cut off the net and it will say uh, call failed. Because if he says call ended, she will call me back. She'll be like, you don't like the questions I'm asking, but I need answers to those questions. I need to know what you're doing with your life. In fact, in fact one day, I kind of like, Cleverly said to her, but it's my life. You don't mind? You understand what I mean? I lived with my sister for six months at a time. And that was all I could take. By the end of the six months, I'm like, if I stay here one more day, one of us would have to go check on Jesus in heaven. But I am thankful to her because of the fact that she will question every assumption you make about anything. Oh, you tell my sister, that, oh man, the reason why I'm at this position right now is because I can't start doing these particular kind of government contracts just yet. She'll be like, why not? I'll be like, well, because they have this requirement. She'll say, well, that's what they published. But have you attempted to apply? Did you call them? I'll be like, I don't have to call them. It's written boldly on their website. And she was like, yeah, but still call them. You never know. Maybe they didn't update the website. And let me tell you something. Almost every time, if I follow that train of thought, it ends up being that, okay, you know, you were right. More often than not. And finally, I got married to my wife and I'm like, oh, thank you, Jesus, I'm delivered from my sister. And it turns out to be that they were running a similar script. I'm like, what a scam. 
I thought I got away, but God just had me all surrounded because my wife does that too. She'd be like, one day I had to say to her, please stop saying that to me. It makes me feel so little. She would say to me, you know, that's all in your head. Because as men, we're very creative. We're imagining, we imagine all the reasons why we shouldn't do a thing. And then she'd be like, it's all in your head. I'd be like, don't say that to me. It's not in my head. It's the reality. And then after she's gone, I'm like, yeah, that was all in my head. You know, thank God for the wisdom that God has given to women. Because they know better than to argue with us sometimes because they're like, you'll find out. You understand what I mean? The women who struggle with their husbands for the most part are the women who want the men to admit right there. No, there's no need. If you want me to admit right there, my ego wouldn't let me. So I'm going to keep arguing. I'm going to grab my keys and find somewhere to go. But just leave me to my own devices. By the time I realize it, I may not immediately come to say that you're right, but it will be written all over my face. And then as men mature, they know how to even come back immediately and say, oh, you were right. Because right now, I don't even have any more ego when it comes to my wife. The moment she's saying it and she's right, but you're right. Let's just get it over with right now. Because there's no need going out. One day, I forgot that I had told my wife the story of how my dad used to get angry and then he would go drive around town and then come back. I forgot that I told her the story. So one day I got angry with my wife. I got in the car and then she didn't call me. After like 10, 15 minutes of driving around the neighborhood, she didn't call me. So I got on the highway. I kept driving. She didn't call me. When I got to 85, she still hasn't called me. So I called her. And I'm like, you know, if you don't call me to apologize, I'm going to go check into a hotel because I'm really hangry. I'm not coming home tonight. She was like, okay, and we'll see you when you come back. I made a U-turn at the next exit because I'm like, I don't think she heard me. And when I got home, she was like, you know that that's what your dad used to do. And then later, he stopped doing it. And that was the last time I did it because I realized that oh, I might as well grow up now than defer my growing up till later. You understand what I mean? Anyway, women have wisdom, great wisdom, God is good. But where I'm going with that is this. We need to question everything about our reality that does not align with what God is saying about us. The reason why you question what God says about you is because you are not questioning what he hasn't said about you. You see, because you are questioning, hum we are questioning beings. We are always asking questions. But when you start questioning what God says, then you're in trouble. Question everything else. If God says you are the head and not the tail, and somebody comes and says that, well, in that industry, give yourself time because you have to start from the bottom. Question that. Because what you might realize is that God in his own wisdom has allowed you to grow in wisdom in his own school through his own process that you don't necessarily have to start from the bottom everywhere. Can I tell you another quick true story before the bell goes up? When I was in my third year at the university, I was supposed to be in my third year but the reality of it was I was on the leave of absence because I just knew that that school stuff was not working. I always tell people, especially when there are young people around, don't drop out of college because I dropped out of college. Just because Bill Gates dropped out of college, don't drop out of college. You're not Bill Gates. You're not Steve Jobs. You're not Moses Anderson. You understand what I mean? You are who you are by the grace of God. That's what the Bible says. I think it was Apostle Paul. It says, I am who I am by the grace of God. So you have to deal with who you are. By the time I took a leave of absence in my third year, I already started a business in my second year that was so successful. They bought me out very quickly. I told you all the story. When I took a leave of absence, it was because I knew that the time that I was in was not the time to enroll in that program, but to await a train that was coming. By the second semester, my dad called me and he says, look, we need to start a business because I'm getting this payout from the bank. They're paying me to go home. My dad was too young and they paid him to retire because he had won all the meritorious awards that they had and they wanted to encourage young people to rise within the bank. So they retired a bunch of people. He says, they're literally paying me to go home. What are we going to do with this money? Money. I was like, well, it's your money. What do you want to do with it? He said, I heard about the business that you started. I said, it wasn't my business. They bought me out of it, but don't ask about the money. 
because I already wasted it. You know, when you're young and you make that kind of money, I was going like on, I was going on holidays almost every other week. I would just pick somewhere new and look for a friend who is bored. You want to go? You understand what I mean? I will come to a classroom where people are studying and I buy everybody Pringles. Simply because, man, I just had the money. I was broke faster than you could say Jack Robinson. Which is okay because sometimes as a little child, like Richard Pryor said, you have to waste it before you can save it. Remember Brewster's Million, that's what I'm saying. Anyway, so when he called me, I was like, what do you want to do? He says, I heard you started a business. I said, okay, so you want that kind of business? He says, I want that kind of business. And that was what we did. But while we were doing that and getting started and doing all the preparation, ordering all the devices, I was still living on campus and I went to my campus fellowship one day and the other students were getting ready to write an exam. And everybody was like, oh, we're praying for the exam period and blah, blah, blah. And I felt left out for a moment. Because people were coming and everybody was asking about the exam. I was in this environment where everybody was a student and I didn't even tell any of my other friends that I had dropped out. I only told my very close friends who did not even come to church. Because you know, sometimes church people are the ones who judge you and the people who don't come to church, they'll take you as you are because they're worse than you. At least in their own eyes. You know, church people always feel like they're better than you. Not this church. I mean, we're saved by grace here. You understand what I mean? So I didn't tell church people, but I told my other boys out there that, man, this thing ain't working. And they're like, man, do you, man? If one of them said to me, he looked at me in the eye and he said to me, he said, before you were here, this other guy was talking about you. And he said he was worried about you. So I looked at him and I told him, why are you worried about Moses? He said, Moses can speak English and he can write in English and he can think. So I think you'll be fine. And I'm like, that's all it takes. He was like, in my opinion. And I'm like, okay, I need more friends like this. You know, what of encouragement. But to cut the long story short, I was in this meeting and I was feeling dejected. Satan came and sat next to me and he says to me, with all these big ideas you have, look at you, you're falling behind. These are the people you used to teach in first year. Second year, you were teaching them computing. You were teaching them sociology. You were teaching them statistics. You, he said, but look at them now. They're writing exams in their third year. Ooh, look at you. And I believe that for a moment. Instead for me to question and say, who are you that you would even take a look into my life? Have you forgotten that I am a mystery? Because you are a mystery even unto Satan. So when he comes to tell you things about you, he's guessing and he wants you to give yourself up. Satan could not identify Jesus. He needed Judas. He needed somebody that was on the inside to give him up because from the outside, he was such a mystical being. He would argue and debate with the Pharisees and they would be so angry, they would want to catch him. But in the midst of everybody, they don't know who he is. And the Bible would say, and Jesus walked by them and he was gone. Have you not read in your Bible that several times Jesus would walk past the same people that wanted to kill him? He was modeling to us that we are mysteries. But we are the ones who stand in front of Satan and say, Satan, look at me, I'm doubting, I don't believe, I'm doubting, I have fears, I have doubts. And Satan is like, oh, got you, I was looking for you. The Bible says Satan is going around like a roaring lion seeking him to devour. He's so angry with you that he can't even see you until you give yourself up. You understand what I mean? And that was what was going on. Satan will come and be suggesting stuff to you to figure out what would happen. It's like, I'm, I'm going to throw this. If he responds, then that's, what he, that's where he's at. So I gave myself up. When Satan was suggesting those things, my countenance fell. But thank God for the Holy Spirit. The Bible says he's the friend that is always alongside. He said to me, he says, come outside. Normally the Holy Spirit can talk to you anywhere. But one of the things that I've realized is that sometimes it changes your environment to change your countenance. On that occasion, he said to me, come outside. So I went outside. As soon as we got outside, he says to me, he said, what was that about? He says, look at you. He said, of this university that these people are in and my university, which one would you choose? I said, I choose your university. He says, have I kicked you out? I said, no. He said, are we making progress? I said, yes. He says, that's what's important. You see, many a times we forget that as far as God is concerned, you are his beloved. 
and you are his righteousness in Christ Jesus. And the Bible says that the path of the righteous shines brighter and brighter unto the perfect day. Don't let the system, standards, and people working for Satan set you back. So if God says you're qualified, yes, you are qualified. If God knows you're not ready, he will keep the opportunity away from you. And if Satan makes a fake opportunity and brings it by discernment, you will know. You understand what I mean? And so don't let the, the question the enemy, but don't question God. Because God's expectations of us, they are true and they are righteous. Because he doesn't expect you to be there guessing your way. Is this good? Is this evil? In the day that he made man, he made man with the divine ability to discern what is on his heart. What is on the mind of God? My announcement to you today is this. The word of the Lord has come to you like it came unto Jeremiah. The Lord said to Jeremiah, stop thinking of yourself as a little child. As far as I'm concerned, we have come a long way. When God called Jeremiah and told Jeremiah what he wanted to do through him, Jeremiah was like, uh, are you talking to me? He said, because maybe you forget I'm but a youth. And God was like, what do you mean you are but a youth? He said, before you were formed in your mother's womb, I've been conversing with you. God told him, he said, before you were formed in the belly, I knew you. While you were yet in your mother's womb, I called you and I ordained you a prophet unto the nations and I put my words in your mouth. That is God's way of saying that I had a conversation with you. And so you have been existing in the mind of God for such a long time before you show up. So don't be fooled by your baby face. As far as God is concerned, you have the wisdom of the ancient. The other day I was taking Ariel to school and because it, I, it's always my wife who takes her to school. So when we got in the car, as we were driving out of the neighborhood, she was like, dad, can we pray? I'm like, sure. She was like, because mama always prays with me and my brothers. I said, oh, absolutely. You know, I was like, yeah. I pretended like I was more righteous than I truly am. I'm like, oh, come on, let's go for it. I was a little embarrassed. I was like, man, she had to remind me of that. And so I tried to make up for what I was not exhibiting. I was speaking in tongues and she was speaking in tongues too. After a while, man, I had to increase the volume of my speaking in tongues. I'm like, this little nine-year-old is not going to outdo me here. You understand what I'm, she was praying like Rosemary. You know how Rosemary prays? When they're speaking in tongues, you, don't, you, you can't even, I mean, you know they're speaking in tongues. Even if you're next door, you, you, you can't miss it. And so guess what happened? After we were done, she just started to make confessions. She was like, I have more understanding than my teachers because I keep the precepts of the Lord. When she said that scripture, it hit me because it was one of the things that God said to me a long time ago because I would always doubt the things that God is showing me that maybe some professor somewhere has discovered it already. Maybe there's a patent already for this thing. Maybe there's a patent for that already. And God, one day he just came through the room and he said to me, he says, you keep my precepts. You have more understanding than the ancient. And that was the end of discussion. Because God has been grooming you even before the ancient received the ordinances of their occult. So why would you sell yourself short? If God is telling you that you are a king and a priest on the earth, if he calls you a royal priesthood and a holy nation, if he calls you a doer of good, because he says, go out there and do good to all men, especially those of the household of faith, that is because he has equipped you with all of what he takes. Stop making excuses for being God's child. One, the other day I was having a conversation with someone and I said, I will not apologize for my privileges. Because that's what we do. Some of us were so sheepish when it comes to who we are. Like, oh, I don't want to do that. No, no, do it because that's what God expects of you. And he will not expect it of you if he hasn't given to you the power and the authority. And I'm going to tell you three things that God expects of you to do on the earth. Jesus says you are the light of the world. You are not the mirror of the world. You're not supposed to reflect what the world is saying. You're supposed to shine a light on worldly situations. But many of us, we only pray what's in the news. And God is like, are you trying to tell me the same news? And we're all watching it together. You're supposed to pray the heart of God by the Holy Spirit. You're supposed to shed the light of God upon situations because there are times wherein the news is telling you one thing because Satan paid for it so that you can have a totally different opinion to what is really happening. It is what it is. Entertainers have always been paid by people to give opinions and impressions whether true or not. 
And that is the reason why you cannot trust any source outside of the voice of God. Romans chapter 3 verse 4 says, let God be true and every man a liar. The word every in English means every, including the one sitting next to you. So if Brother Matthew begins to say things that are contrary to the word of God, you should be able to recognize that, no, this is not God. Because we are who we are by the grace of God. If I'm not speaking the word of God, then I am not part of his church. Jesus says, upon this rock of revelation, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. You are the light of the world. Let us stop following what the world is suggesting to us. We're not a mirror to reflect their position. We are a light to expose their deception. And God expects that of you. You may say, well, but I don't know stuff like the doctors, you know, if the public health system is saying that this is what we do, that is what we do. But let me tell you something. Where did they get their knowledge from? You know, the thing in our world today, yeah, I'm sure you've observed this when they're saying something on the news and they want to convince you, they'll be like, oh, the experts have said. Expert at what? The last one they said was not true. So what are you going to convince me with just your title and just your position? No, Jesus says by their fruits, you shall know them. Not what they say. If your fruits are worthy of your testimony, then that is integrity. I will believe you. But don't just tell me because you went to Harvard, I have to listen to you. No, no offense, John. No, I'm not going to listen to you just because I have a long title. No, you have to have borne the fruits. I need to know that your methods are consistent. Don't give me theories. I am beyond theories. I have the truth of the word of God. The Bible says there was nothing made that was made without the word of God. And God said to me, making a commitment to you and I, that we can just ask him and he will show us great and mighty things which we do not know. In whatever field you find yourself, you should have patents in your name. Whatever field you find yourself, you should be an authority because you operate with the wisdom that created the earth. But I keep telling you, if you don't go to school, listen that. So when it was official that I had dropped out of school because I did not resume my, my leave of absence after two semesters, which makes it official that you've dropped out, one of my pastor friends came to me. This was at the beginning of the fourth year. He said to me, he was like, you know, he said, brother, I believe in you. I know you love God and all of that good stuff. He said, but you're taking such a risk. I said, I know. He said, and you are? I said, I am taking a risk because what it means to live by faith is to be a risk taker. Because if I'm going to work and run my life based on the things that I see, then there's no way I can walk with God because God does not see as I see. The Bible says we should not walk by sight, but walk by faith. Because God does not look at how things appear. He looks at the heart and he knows what is already put in your heart. Why are you selling yourself short? If I was not a risk taker, I would still be in the backside of the desert now. But I took a risk. I left my home country, went to the United Kingdom. I left my position as a senior consultant to the Nigerian government. And I was also consultant for the U.S. government at the same time. I took a risk. I left because God says to leave. A few weeks after I got to England, somebody called me. A strange telephone call. And they described to me the assignment that I was doing in Nigeria. And they said there is an opening for the Department of Works and Pensions. This equivalent of the Department of Government that was working for Nigeria. And I started working on the project. When I got my first paycheck, I called somebody. I'm like, I think you paid two people or three or four. They were like, what do you mean? I said, I just started. Look at what y'all paid me. The guy was like, well, they decided to backdate my pay to the start of the project. So basically, the moment the Nigerian government stopped paying me while I was applying for visas and I was saying my goodbyes and having my living dues and traveling to the UK and getting settled, they backdated my pay in the UK to about that same time frame so I didn't miss a thing. But somebody thought I was taking the risk. He said to me, he said, what if you, what if you one day need that degree? I said, if I one day, for some reason that I can't think about right now, need a degree, I will get the best there is. I told him that and I walked away. The day that I got a phone call from the Royal Holloway University of London, I got a call from the ISG department, the Information Security Group, the same people that wrote the plot for the Da Vinci Code. You know that movie, the Da Vinci Code? The plot of the cryptography was written by Professor Fred Piper. He became a friend of mine during the program because he always said to me, he said, I like the way you think. 
You see, the same people who wrote that plot, they gave me a call and they said they were offering me a, an unconditional admission into their Master of Science degree in information security. And you know what? It was the best there is because they were the ones to start that program globally. Nobody else ever did that program until they started it. As soon as I got off the phone, I called that my friend. I said, hey, dude, how is it going? He said, it's going well. I said, remember the day you told me that what if I need a degree? I said, now I feel like I need one because God is bringing me one. When I told him, he was silent for a little while. I was like, hello, are you still there? I was like, praise the Lord. I tell you that to say this. If we walk with God close enough to see who we are in his reflection, we will not be afraid to go where he sends. Because you will see that he is sending you because he has equipped you. Jesus told his disciples, you don't even need to take your money back with you. Don't take your staff. He says, take nothing. And he was sending them to villages that they did not even know. You know, many of us would have been like, huh, Jesus, maybe you don't know that we don't know this village and they do not know us. So do you not at least give us money or send Judas with us so he can pay for the meals? We are fishermen. We have some money saved. Yeah. Jesus says, no, take nothing. Because when Jesus was sending them, he already saw himself in them. And because he is the creator of all things, the word of God by whom all things were made, he knew that whatever they needed to make was going to materialize. Because faith is what brings things out of nothing. The Bible says the worlds that we see were formed by words that we cannot see. You see, God wants you to think like he thinks. Stop selling yourself short. The other thing that I'm going to tell you, I told you you are the light of the world, but you are also the salt of the earth. Salt is a time machine. Where something is going bad or you don't want it to go bad, what do you do? You season it with salt. And once you season it with salt, it freezes the time, then the meat does not perish anymore. So when God says you are the salt of the earth, he's telling you that so that you know that no matter what's going on in the world, you never miss your own opportunity or time because you are the one that everything responds to. When you need it, it will come to you. So don't feel like some people have left you behind. No, because you are the salt of the earth. The power to preserve has been given to you. So guess what? I'm never late to any game. I'm never late to any party because when I get there, but don't take it personal. If I've come late for your party, that's not what I'm saying. But what I'm saying is in general, when I get to that thing is when it starts. You know what Jesus was called in Revelations? The Bible says he is the beginning and the end. The time that I get to real estate is when real estate begins. The time that I get to that university program, that is when it begins. And when I leave, that is when it ends. So don't let anybody put you under pressure and say, oh, you're late to the game. Oh, they've taken all the money. Oh, they've taken all the jobs. They've taken all the... No, 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 no. They cannot take that which is mine because they don't even have the hands for it. I told you three things, but time is gone. So maybe I'll tell you the third one on Tuesday. Okay, I'll just tell you, I'll tell you because my leader was about to cry. <laughs> Let me say, tell you this, God has an expectation. And his expectation is based on his preparation, how he has prepared you. He has equipped you in a certain way. That is the reason why he will tell you to do things. And so when he says you are the light of the world, it's because he is your light. The Bible says in him was life and that life was the light of men. When he tells you that he is sending you as sheep amongst wolves, it's because he has given you the divine enablement to be gentle as a lamb and to be as cunning as a serpent. Do not underestimate God's command because within every command of God is the power to do all of what he says. And what is the third thing that I want to tell you? It is possible for you to live a life of love. Because he says love your neighbors as I have loved you. He says, love others as I have loved you. And this is one area in which many of us struggle. We struggle to be able to love certain people because we deem them unlovable based on their attitude and based on their repeated stubbornness, based on their persistent fraudulence. And we just feel like, no, 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 I cannot love that person. No, you can do all things because God has given you the divine ability. And do you know the ability that God has given to you, Matthew, that enables you to be able to love all men? 
Do you know what that is? It's giving you the power to forgive sins. Jesus says, I have given you the power to forgive sins. Whosoever you forgive is forgiven. And so if I have the divine ability to forgive sins, then I can love everybody. Because the reason why we struggle to love some people sometimes is because of what they have done. But then I forgive them for what they have done. Oh, you didn't get it. Let me tell you something. Married couples in this place, I pray that you get it. Because the reason why you struggle sometimes to love your spouse is because of the fact that you're like, man, I can't take this anymore. They keep doing this again and again, again and again. But then at the end of the day, if you have forgiven them and they do it, it should be like, okay, wow, this is strange. Unless you never forgave them. No, no, I'm not even joking. This is how God processes things. Aren't you happy that's how God processes things? If God remembers everything that you and I have done, none of us will be here. The Bible says, if the Lord God Almighty, the one who sits in the heavens, if he regards iniquity, no man will stand. Nobody will stand. Not even Paul the apostle. You know, everybody thought that Paul was the holiest of holies. But when he came to Romans chapter 7, he says, I'm one of y'all. He says, in my, in my own case, I've actually gotten really good at the bad things I'm not supposed to do. He says, the evil that I will not to do, that I know that I shouldn't do, is what I practice. In fact, when he was writing, who was he writing to? The people of Colossae. He wrote to some people and he said to them, he says, in case you're wondering, I am the chief of sinners. And that is Apostle Paul. So be, be, go easy on Kenyatta. Okay, that's what I'm saying. Go easy on Jordan. Because if Apostle Paul would admit a thing like that, how about us who are tempted in even more ways than he can imagine? Oh yes, I say that with the authority of the times that we're living in because the Bible says in our own time, immorality will fill the earth. Those people only got a taste of immorality, so they cannot boast. The Bible says, let no man take this honor unto himself. And so here we are. We are here and God still loves us. He wants to visit with us. Isn't it amazing that after all of our foolishness, we'll call his name and he answers? And he doesn't answer with thunder to strike you down. He answers to say, hey, missed you. Because the Bible says he has loved us with an everlasting love. He can't even help himself. And so when the Bible says that love, as I have loved you, it, it is possible you can because he has given you the power to forgive. And the Bible says that love does not keep record of wrong. And so that spouse that you say is always doing the same thing, it's not, the problem is not with them. The problem is with you not exercising your divine privilege and authority to forgive sins. If you are forgiving them every time they've done it and they just happen to do it again, it should be like, wow, this is strange. This is not my husband. I need to pray for him. I need to stand by him. I need to love him through this. Because why, where is this even coming from? Because love genuinely does not keep record of wrong. But the reason why you don't make yourself available to help your brothers and sisters is because you have so many things against them. They owe you so much in your life. Today, you're not getting any patience from me. Wives, especially. Because like I told you, the wives that we have, God calls them a name that makes us happy, but also makes us cry. When God gave Eve to Adam, what did God tell Adam that he was receiving? He says, you're receiving a help. And when God gives you help, say thank you, but also say, oh my God. Because God told Moses, when Moses was getting frustrated because of the children of Israel, God was like, okay, okay, okay. I am sending my angel to go ahead of you. He will help you, but wait a minute. Because when God said that, Moses was like, woohoo! God was like, oh, before you get too excited. He says, this angel is your help, but he doesn't forgive. So do not grieve him. Jesus told his disciples, he was quoting from the wisdom of Solomon. If you read the wisdom of Solomon, you will find it there. When, when God was described, his son was described, and the Holy Spirit was described. Jesus says, any blasphemy against the Father is forgiven. And the blasphemy against the Son can be overlooked. He said, but the blasphemy against the Holy Spirit is not forgiven because he doesn't forgive. And he is the only one that was called our help. Jesus says, the Father will send you another comforter, and he will be your help. Your alos paraclet is the help, is the teacher, is the comforter. And is the one that does not forgive blasphemies. And so you wonder the reason why women struggle to forgive is because in their nature, they are patterned after the spirit of God. 
after the angel of God. They are your help. And so every man that comes to understand that will thread carefully. No, I'm not saying that so that you can walk on eggshells around your wives. I am saying that so that you can develop divine patience. I've counseled many people. We, my wife and I would do marriage counseling. We used to do a lot of it. Guess what? One of the biggest problems is when something happens, the husband is always like, but that was a while ago, but she keeps bringing it up. She keeps bringing it up. Women have the divine ability to keep bringing things up. So that's why you need to divine, develop the divine ten tenacity to be okay with it. Because as a man, the moment you recognize that they don't forgive easy, that they don't let go of things easy, they still love you, but they just haven't let go of it. So when they bring it up again, you just tell yourself, this is the first time they're bringing it up. And I'm like, I'm sorry. I'm really sorry, honey. And that will never happen again. Oh, that was what you said the last time. And in your mind, they're like, what last time? Just delete it. I just, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. You know what? Because I have forgiven myself for the last time. Because the Bible says, whosoever you forgive, it did not say when you forgive others. It says, whosoever. So I forgive myself too. You understand what I mean? So because I have forgiven myself, I do not keep record of wrong. When she says it, I am not getting upset and I'm not thinking, oh my God, this woman just stopped talking about it already. You see, it works both ways. God has given you the power to love because he has given you the power to forgive sins. So don't let any situation or any devil tell you that you cannot walk in love. Don't let anybody put you under the weight of sin or under the weight of oppression for things that God has already given you the power to overcome. So today, if you do not remember anything, but I pray that you remember all things, but just remember this one thing, God has an expectation of you that is based on the divine abilities that he has given to you so that you and I are without excuse. Whatever I see in God's word, if he says to me, this book of the law shall not depart from my mouth, but I will meditate on it day and night. It's because he has given me the ability to meditate upon it day and night. So no job, no schedule, no Netflix should keep me from doing what he says. Whatever it is that God says, Chris, Jesus told his disciples, Luke 18:1, that men ought always to pray and not to faint. Paul repeated it in 1 Thessalonians, I believe chapter 5 verse 17, pray without ceasing. So if God is expecting me to pray always, that means he's giving me the ability to pray always. I just need to find it. Where did I put it? Where have I been hiding it? Where? Where have I been hiding it? That ability is there. And sometimes, if you don't know where it is, just call it forth and say, the spirit of prayer, come out. Because I need to pray. The spirit of consistency, come out. Because those spirits of graces and the spirits of virtues are no longer outside of you. They are now on the inside of you. Jesus told his disciples, out of your belly shall flow rivers of living water. So whatever it is I need, he has already given to me all things that pertain to life and godliness. So if I have a dream and I don't understand my dream, I call forth interpretation from the inside of me. Stop looking for help in all the wrong places. Your help is on your inside and he is called the Holy Spirit. That river of living water, he will pump it up for you because he's the wind of heaven that brings to you the hydraulic power of angels that allows for you to reign on the earth as a son of God in glory and in majesty that the glory ultimately might be God's. We're going to break bread today with a verse of scripture from the book of Jeremiah chapter 7 verse 3. And I pray that as we receive this body of Jesus and the blood of Jesus as we do this in remembrance of him now this word of God that is coming forth today will do to you more than just excite your intellect but it will do to you the work of the restoration of your peace in the mighty name of Jesus Jeremiah chapter 7 verse 3 I think we read that a little while ago this is what the Bible says in Jeremiah chapter 7 verse 3 Thus says the Lord of hosts. I hope you guys know when the Bible says the Lord of hosts, it is a way of reminding you that whatever follows is possible because God has all that power. The Lord of hosts means the God of the angel armies. The host here refers to the innumerable company of angels, warring angels. And so whenever you see the Lord of hosts, just know that whatever follows, it's all right because there is plenty of power on my side. Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, amend your ways and your doings and I will cause you to do well in this place.
He said, amend your ways and your doings and I will cause you to dwell in this place. Where is this place? The earth. Jesus says in Matthew chapter 5, that blessed are the meek for they shall inherit the earth. No matter what anyone is trying to do to this world, no matter what they're trying to do to this earth, it is yours and mine to inherit. But for us not to be swept with the wind of God's judgment, we need to do what he says. And whatever he says, you can do it because he has empowered you to obey him. So amend your ways. Stop selling yourself short. I keep hearing that like it's playing on auto repeat. Many of us have sold ourselves short. Where you're living right now, you're living there because you think that's what you can afford, not because what God can afford. Someone says, oh, but I don't want to stretch myself. Okay, that's if you are the one that is providing for you. Many people are like, man, I can't apply for that job because I'm not even qualified. Okay. But God qualifies you because you're not qualified to come to his presence. He qualifies you. So call them and tell them that you're interested in that job. And if they say, do you have this? You don't have that? You'd be like, but I have this and I have that. Don't agree with them on what you don't have. Tell them what you do have. I told you the story of the first hour I came to America the first time. What they were asking for. I hadn't gotten it yet. And so instead of agreeing with them concerning what I didn't have, I told them what I had. And they were like, okay, we'll take it. And I'm like, there you go. It can be that simple. Just tell them what you have. Amend your ways. Okay, let's break bread. In fact, let me give you one more. And then we can truly break bread. You see, we're going to read verse 5 of that same chapter. Jeremiah. I mean, I love Jeremiah. I mean, Jeremiah is a very, very cool dude. Yeah, he was young and fiery. Oh, yes. There you go, verse 5. It says, for if you thoroughly amend your ways <laughs> and your doings, if you thoroughly execute judgment between man and his neighbor. You see, two weeks ago, God started talking to us about judgment, how to judge with the righteous judgment, maybe three weeks ago. And we started talking about the fact that prayer is how we pass judgment, right? Because we declare things in the courts of heaven, it's called praying and judgment is effected. So when you see children being molested in the world and being trafficked, you're not supposed to just be sorry for them. You're supposed to go to the courts of heaven in prayer and set those children free because you have the power. Politicking is not gonna do it. Policies will not do it and charity organizations who are doing it without the power of Jesus cannot get it done. If they can't, they would have done it a long time ago. We're beginning to see that people who are in places of prominence in our world are involved in all this pedophilia that is going on. And so who do you want to ask to come and make the policy? God allows those things. Like I told you, we're kind of, we're very similar to Jeremiah, this generation. Because Jeremiah did not know how much power he had and God wanted to show him. So God raised a lot of opposition. People wanted to shut him down. Every time they wanted to shut Jeremiah down, he became even more bold. Some of his most fantastic prophecies came when they, were, when they imprisoned him. You know that a lot of those prophecies was when he was in prison. He was prophesying on the streets and they said he was annoying the political elite of the day. They said the kings and the princes do not like what you say. Therefore, we shall put you away. And they put him away and from there he started prophesying even more boldly. You see, because what God does is God helps us to let go of our comfort zone so that we can realize how much potential we have. But we don't have to always keep pushing him to the level wherein he has to do that. You see, many of us will want God to hide the shoes that we're wearing now so that if we don't see it, we'll go and get the new shoes that he has for us. But he doesn't have to do it that way. Just do it thoroughly. He says, amend your ways thoroughly. Learn how to judge between man and his neighbor. When whatever people are doing, judge with the righteous judgment. So I want to encourage you folks as we break bread today, make a fresh commitment to not discern or to not judge the things of your life based on what you think is good or based on what people say is evil. No, it's not about good and evil. It's about what God says to you.
is about you staying connected to his heart. So as you break bread today, as you take of the Lord's body and drink of his blood, I want you to say to yourself, sitting down, because this is where we make that declaration. I want you to remind yourself and say to yourself, I am a king and a priest because my God made me so. I can love like Jesus loved me, loves me. I can love like God loves me. And I can see what God sees about me. So I'm no longer judging by my own limitations. I judge by the grace of God in Christ Jesus. Praise the Lord. You may eat of the Lord's body and drink of his blood in remembrance of him. Praise the Lord. So for now, I want us to do one more thing, one more thing for just about two seconds. It is time for us to amend our ways. Wherever you might be in this auditorium. I believe every one of us should actually say this prayer. So let's just be in a posture of prayer. If it works for you to bow your head, bow your head, kneel down if you want to, stand up if you need to. But let us make sure that at this particular moment, it doesn't matter what is happening next to us. It is now just myself and my heavenly father. I want to amend my ways. I want you to tell God in your own words that you have been believing in yourself and, in, and believing in everything else more than you believe in him. Confess before the Lord how you have partnered with the enemy to shortchange yourself. Every time you stopped, you stopped short of what God has for you because of fear, because of unbelief, because of self-confidence, because of ego, because of pride, and sometimes because of ignorance, you are selling yourself short. And so just repent and let your repentance begin with a confession. Because true repentance, even though it begins with believing in your heart and confessing with your mouth, it is meant to continue by you completely changing your mindset to amend your thoughts, to amend your ways. To say, I am no longer going to live my life the way that pleases me, but I will live my life the way that pleases you, Heavenly Father. I will take time to look into your word, to see what things you have said, concerning me to see what things you have spoken to others in the past so that I can learn how you speak to men for me to hear your voice. I believe in you, Jesus, and I declare with my mouth that you are the Lord of my life. That means you have the final say, you have the authority. As you're saying these prayers, if you know deep within your heart that you would love for someone to pray with you, I want you to just come forward and stay here at the end of the service. And someone's going to pray with you and agree with you in prayer that this is the beginning of the rest of your life. That you're turning a new leaf today to say, you know what? I am no longer, no longer going to see myself as unable. I will no longer see myself as grasshoppers in their sight. I will no longer see myself as the one who looks after me, but I will see myself as the one that God cares for, the one who has help. Folks, it is time to rise, and we rise by believing that God is the lifter of our heads. God is the glory and the lifter of your head, so rise, because in his faithfulness, it will lift you up. In the mighty name of Jesus. And lastly, I want you to say that I would love as God loves me. I will love others as he loves me. In the mighty name of Jesus. Praise the Lord. God bless you guys. Alan.
Praise the Lord. Let's uh, celebrate the man of God. <laughs> Hallelujah. Um, I'm glad, really thankful for this altar call, this time for prayer, because we know this is the season that we enter into those things that the Lord has for us. And why not receive prayer on getting those things right now? A lot of the things that we missed out on is because we've been in the way. Okay, and so let's take this time of prayer that we're going to have in just a couple of minutes here to really just receive that renewal, okay, stepping in so that we are in position. We give God praise. Um, Joshua, if you help us with the uh, giving details, we're just going to take a couple of seconds to prepare our offering to give unto the Lord in worship. We are so thankful for what he's done in here tonight. You'll see there the ways to give, um, Cash App, Zelle. We have envelopes here um, and pens if you need to uh, fill out a check or uh, to give any cash. And let's just give and worship and, and thanks unto the Lord for his mercy or this instruction that we've received on tonight. Hallelujah. Father, we give you praise. There's none like you, O oh God. You have seen about us tonight. Lord, you make yourself available unto us, O oh God. For your word declares, draw nigh unto me, and I will draw nigh unto you. Father, we thank you for this open invitation. O oh God, this time of renewal for your mercy truly endures forever. It's new, morning by morning. We thank you for this morning's mercy, O oh God, that we experience the fragrance of, the presence of even now in this meeting, O oh God, as you have given us the instruction, O oh God, as you have made available your hand, O oh God, your mercy, your favor in this hour. Lord, we ask of thee that these offerings be pleasing unto you, be sweet smeller. And we give unto you, giving you all glory, all honor and praise in the mighty name of Jesus. And everyone said, amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So we'll be back here Tuesday for family dinner and teaching. Uh, come prepare, come ready. We know the Lord has just been dealing with us in declaring the word. All right. Uh, just recently, we shared some of the scriptures that we've been declaring, that we've been sharing with each other here in the house. Make sure in your prayer time that you're declaring the word and positioning yourself for the Lord to move in your behalf. OK, he's already done it. That's what I keep hearing. He's already done it. I saw men giving praise to God for what he's done. It's just unto us to speak it. Just speak it and keep speaking it. All right. We give God praise. And so as we wrap up. Uh, as the man of God has instructed us, if you want to come forward for prayer, please come uh, and we will be here. If not, we'll see you later. Father, we give you praise. We thank you so much for what you've done for us tonight. <laughs> we thank you for your open invitation, oh God. We just love you for your mercy. We just love you for your mercy. Oh God, all glory and honor belong to you in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. <laughs>